Well, we're going to get right into it this morning and um, get back to talking about the developing spiritually and talking about the different stages. Yesterday, I talked about the fact that just like in the natural, you can uh, watch how an individual grows in the natural, that the spiritual always parallels with the natural. Anytime you're trying to teach a spiritual truth, the best way to teach that truth is to use a natural truth that parallels with it so that you can expound on it well. Anytime you separate the super from the natural, you're gonna have some problems and with people getting a comprehending and understanding. And so it's why Jesus taught us in parables because he knew that if he could take a, a natural truth and then build a spiritual truth or show us how it correlates with the supernatural, we would always understand it. And so this is why it's important for us to be able to do this. And so looking at us growing up spiritually and looking at what it means to be in the babyhood stage or the infancy stage of our development, in the childhood stage of our development, and then in the manhood stage of our development. There are three stages that we will go through spiritually. And it's important, I said yesterday, for you to be able to pinpoint exactly where you are in this process. We talked yesterday about the natural baby, the innocence, the, the babies are uh, ignorant and babies are innocent. And the first thing, you know, that when we think about a baby, the first thing that attracts most of us to a baby is the baby's size. Remember I said that, and the baby's innocence, you know, why is that? Because the baby hasn't had an opportunity to get involved anything, in anything. The baby hasn't op hadn't had an opportunity to do anything wrong, you know, but we just, we just love babies. And so when we move into this space where we're developing spiritually, it's important for us to understand that God has an expectation that we're going to go from babyhood stage to childhood stage, even to adolescence, which I'm not really going to get into today, but then we move ourselves into a, adulthood and a father or a mother that can see their children not growing in things are concerned about that child. And so if you're still in the same space that you were this time last year, you know, I was just in Dallas. And while I was in Dallas, you know, my son lives there and my grandsons, they came to pick me up at the airport. And when, you know, my grandsons, they always, whenever they see me, they jump out of wherever they are, they run and, you know, they come to hug me. Well, my husband and I walked out of the airport and my son, Caleb, my oldest grandson, Caleb, who is 14 years old, peeled himself out of my son's little, small little car. And when he stood up, he just kept going up. Now, this was just two weeks ago. He's 6'1 at 14 years old. I saw him in, in uh, March and he was not at the height that he is now. What's happening? He is growing and he's developing. That's how it should be for us spiritually, that people should be like, wow, what happened in your life that you've gotten so tall? What have you been eating? What have you been feeding on? What have you been doing to ensure your growth at the level that you're growing at? And so this is what we want in our lives as believers. We want people to be able to tell. Somebody should be able to just look at me and see that I've grown spiritually. You don't have to have conversations with me. I mean, and of course the conversations are important, but I don't have to come to you telling you, yep, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wonder. You know, we don't have to do any of those things. Let your life speak to your maturity, all right? And so when you think about uh, babies, you think about the fact that babies are not, you know, I mentioned this yesterday, that babies can't feed themselves that babies need somebody else to feed them. And as we're advancing and doing, if you're still in a place where you need somebody to feed you, that means that you're still in the babyhood phase of your walk with Christ. And there's nothing wrong with needing somebody. And I wanna say that, that there is nothing wrong with any phase of your development. There's nothing wrong with it. However, if you've been walking with God for any significant amount of time and you've been in a position where you've been sitting under the word, there is an expectation of growth in your life. We understand that there are people that get saved 
And it's like I said yesterday, they give birth to these babies and then they just leave the babies on the birthing table and they never do anything to cultivate their relationship with God or to see them grow. You've got to feed a baby to ensure that that baby grows. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. If you still find yourself in a place where I don't get this, I don't understand this, I need somebody to feed me, get yourself in a place where you can be fed, whether it's in a small group context or whether it's in a, a, a church group setting, whatever it is that you prefer, just get some place where you can get fed. And, you know, and I don't usually don't promote our church, but we're outreach. We're very good at getting people developed and into the call and the plan of God for their lives. And so, you know, when, when we think about growing up, you don't want to be the one who grows older and then falls into this I know it all attitude trap as you're growing. You can't tell me anything. If you do, I'll move, you know, in I'll, you'll move yourself beyond help and then you won't grow. You don't want that. You always want to be teachable. At the age that I'm at and at the place that I've, I've gone through a lot of things in ministry, I've been in the ministry for 30 years, 30 plus years, honestly. And in all the years that I've been in ministry, I've always fought to keep myself in a place of teachability. You never want to get to a place where somebody cannot teach you. I have right now the people that I've mentored and developed in life and in ministry. They're now teaching me. I'm sitting under people like Cheryl McMurtry, Tim McMurtry, Giles Patterson, Dana World Patterson. I'm sitting under them. Well, there was a season of their life where I was the teacher. I was the one investing in them. And now they're investing in me. And that's the beautiful thing about it. You can never get yourself so mature and so big that you can't grow. And so you don't want to out talk your teacher. It, 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 it's like nails on a chalkboard for me when I'm supposed to be imparting into someone and they're doing all the talking. And it's, it's fine in a certain context, but if I'm supposed to be mentoring you, then there needs to be a place where you have to be quiet. If you're here to be discipled, if you're here to be learn, learned, then you gotta be quiet and let somebody invest in you. Don't out talk your teacher. All right, you know, but that's characteristic of a spiritual baby. They cannot hold their tongue. They cry whenever they want to. They talk whenever they want to, whenever they feel like it. As long as they think somebody is listening, they're going to just spew it out. You know, I was uh, teaching uh, this past week and uh, my friend brought her baby in. Now he's just a, you know, he's just, he's not even one, I don't believe. But while I was teaching, every time I would say something, he would say something. And that's happened at times gone by in the church where people will have their babies in the service and I will say something or my husband will say something and the baby will say something because, because babies don't get it. Babies don't get it. And so when you have an individual who in a, who's an adult and the teacher is trying to teach them, but they're just spewing off instead of listening, that's a sign that you are in the babyhood phase of that area of your life. And you may not be that in that, that place in every area of your life, but in that phase, you are. And so we gotta work hard to have an open and a teachable spirit. And, 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 and it's an innocent spirit is really what it is. It's toward God and it's toward those that have to teach us. You know, I remember sitting when I was a member of the church that I came out of, you know, I sat, and I never grew to the place that I couldn't receive from the people that are around me. I graduated from Bible school. When I graduated from Bible school, having to do two years in Bible school, when I came back, I was told, here is the protocol. Now, I had already done all of the new membership classes and everything before I left to go to school. But when I came back, my pastor said, here is what I need you to do, because I need you, one, to be an example. But I was like, you don't have to tell me that. If this is what you require of me, this is what I will do. So I moved myself into those places that he called me to be in and told me that I needed to be in. And I sat through every class, every training, every development, and I grew as a result of it. Even if some of the information that I received was redundant and it was repetitive, I still grew because faith cometh by hearing. Faith does not come by having heard. And that's important for you to understand. You will always be able to hear a truth from the word of God from a different perspective, and it'll shed a different light on it. So, you know, one of the characteristics of a baby is their innocence. But then the other piece is their ignorance. 
you know, one thing that's common among all babies is that they think they can put anything that get in their hand into their mouth, meaning they think they can eat on anything. And it takes them up to a person to keep them from putting what could be very harmful to them in their mouth. A newborn baby will put his hands in his mouth and as he grows and he gets a little older, he'll start picking up things that are around him and put those things in his mouth. He'll put a screwdriver in his mouth. He'll put a spoon in his mouth. If he finds a spider, it goes in his mouth. It doesn't matter what it is. His natural reflex is to taste whatever it is that he comes in contact with because babies are ignorant concerning these things and they don't know what should go in their mouth and what shouldn't. And babies have died as a result of the negligence of the people that are guarding them, you know, in their season or their, their time of innocence. They got a hold of something that was poisonous and, and it, unfortunately it took their life. What am I trying to say? Is that we have to be careful about what goes into our spiritual mouths. And honestly, that's for every stage of our development, but especially for babies. You got to watch out for what you read, what you hear, and what you take into your ear and your eye gates. I don't care what you say. Everything that's labeled Christian is not good for your spirit. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, fear, ideologies, uh, philosophies, and doctrines that do nothing but poison people. It's a lot of religion and what it does is it robs people of their spiritual growth and many of their own testimony. You know, there's story after story after story of men and women who started out strong. The power of God was manifested in their life, but somewhere along the way, they started entertaining false doctrine or false teachings. And before you knew it, they were putting the wrong thing in their mouth and they started questioning the reality of the word of God, why they believe what they were believing. And before long, they lost their spiritual footing. We can't be deceived. You can't listen to everything. And just because it's dubbed Christian television, gospel music, it does not mean it. You got to back up what you hear and you got to put it in the light, shed the light. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So you take the word of God. You know, we've got these, these uh, lights on here where you can put a flashlight on your phone. And what you do is you shine the light of the word of God on any doctrine that you may receive. If it doesn't bear witness, this is why you got to stay with the word. This is why you got to stay with the word. Because the Satan will even give you voices from, from here. And so voices from with here need to line up with the voices that are written. And if what you hear out here cannot be confirmed and validated by what you see in the word of God, get rid of it. Don't receive it. And so we have to keep ourselves on the fundamental truth of the doctrine of the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, I will not consume it. And today, a lot of Christians have bought into the lie that you don't have to go to church as a Christian. It's true. You don't have to be in the physical building, but you do have to be around people who can help develop you. The Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And people will twist that scripture to make it say what they want. But what's happening is the spiritual babies in our midst are getting caught up in the tide of, of our false doctrines and our ideologies instead of us staying with the word of God and keeping them in the right path. And so it's important. It's really, really important. You know, you don't want to move yourself into a place where you're listening to something and then it just opens up, you know, opens you up just a little bit to a little bit of, 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 of false doctrine. Because the Bible says uh, the small foxes are what spoil the vine. And so when you think about your life, you got to be careful because all it takes is a little bit of yeast to make that bread rise. The Bible calls it leaven. A little bit of leaven will make that whole cake come up. And so what you want to make sure of is that you're staying with the word of God, you know? And so, you know, when, when, when we're moving into this, this is really important. Ephesians chapter 4, 13 says this, till we all come into the unity of the faith, all come into the unity of the faith. And so anytime you find people moving into sets and, 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 uh, uh, little factions and different things that divide and separate the body of Christ, not work to build it. That's poisonous. And it's a work of the enemy. The spirit of God will never bring division. 
And that's the thing that you got to understand. He will never, ever bring division. Never. And so when you know that you know that you know that God has called you and that God is working in your life, when you move yourself into the places of spiritual growth, you'll be able to see God moving and working in your life in a really powerful way. You know, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday about how we can walk with people and have an expectation that the people in our lives are going to walk with us the way that we walk. You can't mentor somebody and push them along at the same time. You got to take your time. And if you realize that you're on step number 15 and the person that you're working with is on step number three, you can't go down to step number three and force that person up to step number 15. Because even if you got them to step number 15, you have bypassed processes that are necessary or essential for the growth of that individual to be able to stay at step number 15. And it'll just be the right, all you, you'll be waiting for is the right circumstance that will come. Because remember, it's not if a circumstance will come. It's when a circumstance will come. You're going to just wait for the right circumstance to come and it's going to knock them back down to the step that they were on. And this is why we have a lot of believers who have been done with the church. It's like, I'm done with that. I'm done with Christianity. I'm done with the church because it's too difficult to live out. I tried that, you know, like the man that said, I tried that faith business and it didn't work. But really what ended up happening was the faith business tried them and they didn't work. Why? Because they did not go through the proper processes. You've got to learn and grow. My kids did not go. And I said it yesterday. They didn't go from age three to age 15 in a day, in a week, in a month. It took years for my kids to get from one place to the next, 12 to be exact, to get from age three to age 15. And in every phase of their growth, something in their life shifted and they started feeding on a different level. When my kids were small, I had to give them food that was almost, you know, all they could drink when they were infants, all they could drink was uh, breast milk. And then they would go as they grew, we went from breast milk to pureed food, to food that was almost liquefied, green beans, liquefied, broccoli, liquefied. Then they went from that, why? Because their stomachs only had the capacity to receive what was liquefied. But then as they, we continued to feed them, what we were feeding them produced growth and nutrients and sustenance on the bones and all of that. It gave them what they needed so that they could develop into these strong little individuals that could handle a chicken nugget. And so they went from pureed green beans to a chicken nugget, but they weren't ready for steak. Y'all know what I'm saying and you understand what I'm saying. They weren't ready for everything that, that, you know, that we could give them. And you've got to remember this about people that we're walking with. You may believe that the person that you married or the person that you're in relationship with is spiritually strong. But I'm telling you, sometimes people will put on a face so that it can appear that they are where you are. And the litmus test becomes once you get married or once you really start walking with an individual and you start seeing behavior in their life that's not consistent with step number 15. It's more consistent with step number three. And so what do you do? Do you fall out? Oh, my God. I thought you were on step number 15. And really, you're only on step number three. Well, what do we do? I'm leaving you because you're not at the level that I thought that you were at. That is not God. What do we do? the true test that we are children of God. He said, this is how they're going to know that you love me. This is how they're going to know that you are mine. It's how you love one another. And love will recognize that you're on step number three. So I need to come down on step number three, even though I'm on step number 15. I'll have one foot on step 15 and I'm going to bring one foot down. Um, no, no, no. Let me say it like this. I'm going to keep my feet in step number 15, but I'm going to bring my hands into step number three. Why? So that I can pull you up, not drag you up, but pull you up. 
And in pulling you up, I'm not using natural force. I'm using supernatural force. And what am I doing? I'm feeding you the things that you need to make you stronger so that I'm not doing the walking for you. When you think about a baby, mom can't walk for that baby. Dad can't walk for that baby. But what mom can do is prop baby up. Give baby something to hold on to when baby gets ready to take their steps. But mama can't walk for the baby. Daddy can't walk for the baby. And you can't walk for the person that you want to see grow and develop spiritually. You can prop them up. You can put them in the right direction. You can keep them out of danger. Danger. You can be there if they start, you know, babies, they wiggle and wobble. You can be there to ensure that you catch them if they fall or that you pick them up if they fall, but you can't walk for them. And so that's the thing that you've got to understand. And so you, you, you have no idea how many individuals I said, back it up. One, we don't shove God down anybody's throat. I know from experience when I first married my husband. So here's a little testimony for you all. I'm speaking from experience. When I first married my husband, he wasn't pastor skip. But I had been walking with God. I'd given my life to the Lord and he went to church, but he didn't have a relationship with God. And so when we came into relationship with one another, you know, I, I wanted this spiritual giant. I wanted this man that was hobo -shian. And if I could come to him and say, what is God saying to you? He could drop it, you know, in any moment, at any time. He could tell me what God was wanting. He could guide me. He could lead me. He was going to be the spiritual head of my household. He was going to be the spiritual priest. That's what I wanted. And that was ideal. That was what was uh, modeled for me at church, not at home. See, I didn't see everything that was going on in the household. I saw what was going on at church. And I saw that and that created a desire in me. And so when I married my husband, that desire shifted from a desire to a demand. And so I went from desiring that to demanding that this is who you're going to be. This is how you're going to live. And if you're not going to live that way, then you're not, a, you're not the man or the person that I thought you were. And my marriage went through hell because of me, because of my self-righteousness, because of me being the one that, you know, felt like I was, I was the one that was more spiritual. And I shared that with you all, that in times gone by, I would challenge him, you know, but then if something would go wrong, now listen to this. Talking about spiritual development. I thought I was the spiritual one because I spent the most time praying. I spent the most time fasting. I spent the most time reading my Bible. But guess what? When we got into it, I was the first one to cuss him out. Not him, me, me, him. I was the first one to cuss him out. I was the first one to distance myself. I was the first one to act in my flesh, not him. And so here this spiritual giant was, you know, was doing all the stuff that she was doing, you know, but then when something hit her life, she couldn't stand the test, but he could. When something hit his life, he could stand the test, you know, and one day I'll never forget it. You know, I'm praying and I'm talking to God about, you know, where he's not and what he's not doing. And I will never forget this. The spirit of God said to me, oh, you're the spiritual one. Well, when things go wrong, who's the first one to cuss somebody out? Me. Oh, you the spiritual one. But when, you know, when y'all get into it, who's the first one to distance themselves? No sex, no intimacy, no coming together. Now, this, I'm talking about me and my husband. Who's the first one to distance themselves and to go off in a corner and won't talk for two weeks at a time? Me. So how do you think you the most spiritual one? This is the spirit of God talking to me. How do you think that you're the most spiritual one? The most spiritual one is the one that will yield to my spirit and to my word in any given situation. That's the most spiritual one. Not the one that's walking around talking about haya, hobo she. That ain't the one that's the most spiritual. The one that's mo the most spiritual is the one that will do what God says and that will act like Christ in any given situation. You got it twisted, Melba. And so I, what did I have to do? I had to get up, up off Skip and leave Skip alone and let Skip do his thing because I realized Melva had a whole lot of work to do on Melva. You know, that whole scripture about getting the, 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 the tree stump out of your eye before you try to get the twig out of somebody else's eye. That's the philosophy here. And so God was saying to me, don't get deceived by your, your religious works. 
your legalism and your self-righteousness, thinking that that's what's making you the most spiritual person or the, the adult Christian. No, the one that obeys my word, the one that yields to love, the one that yields to my spirit is the one that's most spiritual, not the one that can quote scriptures off the top of their head and the one that goes to church all the time. That doesn't make you more spiritual. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. It, it will, it'll bless you. It'll increase your life. No doubt. But that doesn't make you spiritual. There's so many Christians in the church that are carnal, carnal Christians. I said it. Yes, it's the truth. Yes. We're striving for maturity in our walk with God. And that's what this conversation is all about. But we got to get away from this idea that somebody is less spiritual than we are because they don't do what we do. I hope I said something today that's helped you, that's blessed you. I hope I've increased you in some way today because my desire is to see you all grow, to see you grow up into Christ and all things. Remember, I talked about that, 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 uh, that, um, what is it? That framing of the body of Christ against the wall and us being on the inside of that. And God's desire is for us to grow up into Christ in all things. That's the whole purpose behind fresh baked manna every morning. God bless you all. I love you. I hope I said something good. Love you. Bye-bye.